Welcome to the Gem Stream, a production of Gem State Substack. I'm your host, Brian Allman. Remember to subscribe at gemstate.substack.com. Free subscribers get tons of content, but to get it all, plus early access to articles, videos, and podcasts, I invite you to become a paid subscriber for $9.99 a month. Doing so also enables me to get out there and get the information that you need to know to make a positive change in the Gem State. Today, I am very excited to present a conversation with Matt McCaw of the Greater Idaho Movement. This is a movement that was born in eastern Oregon that seeks to move our border from the Snake River all the way to the Cascade Mountains, bringing the eastern counties of Oregon into Idaho. It's a very interesting idea, but before you dismiss it as unlikely, consider the place our country is in today, and how much we've seen change over just the last 10 years. We need to have conversations like this to prepare for the uncertain times ahead. So, without further ado, Matt McCaw. Matt, thanks for uh, joining me today. Um, I guess just to start us off, tell us a little bit about the Greater Idaho Movement for those who might not be aware of it. Yeah, so thanks for having me, Brian. I'm happy to be on and, and talk, especially to your listeners in Idaho, because I think people in Oregon hear a lot more about Greater Idaho because it's, it's uh, you know... It's just more in the news here, and, and I think a lot of folks in Idaho, they kind of hear about it, but they don't really, you know, it's kind of this thing that's happening that involves them, but but they're not super clear about it. So any chance to get to talk to, to folks in Idaho, I, I really appreciate. So Greater Idaho Movement is, is really pretty simple. It's this idea that the people of Eastern Oregon are far more similar to the people in Idaho in, in every way, culturally, economically, socially, politically. They vote the same way. They make their living the same way as the people of Idaho. They want the same things. They have the same values as the people in Idaho. And, and so it would make more sense for the people of Eastern Oregon to get their state level government from the state of Idaho, which matches their values and matches what they want out of their state government. Um, so what we have in, in the state of Oregon, it, for people that don't know, the west side of our state, when, when you go on the west side of the Cascades, it's urban. Um, it's very green. It has a completely different climate than, than the east side, uh, completely different economic base than the east side of the state and, and a, a different value set. They want different things for their communities. They want different things out of government. But 75 percent of the population of Oregon lives in the northwest part of the state. So essentially what happens in, in Oregon is that whatever is decided, whatever the people in the northwest part of the state want, they get because they have the numbers, they, they overwhelm uh, the rest of the state in the legislature, they overwhelm the rest of the state on ballot measures. And so our state level government in the state of Oregon is very blue, it's very left leaning um, because the numbers are, are that way and that's the kind of government they want. But it doesn't represent well the entire state and it certainly doesn't represent the east side of the state, which is extremely conservative and, and votes very red. And, and so we have this mismatch in Oregon of state government that is kind of forcing policy on on a part of the state that doesn't want it doesn't vote for it and it causes a, a lot of tension and and you know we see this all over our country where you have kind of this urban uh culture and this rural culture and they kind of you know play tug of war over state level government often and it's kind of one side uh imposing their their policies and their values on the other and and it causes it causes tension and it causes grief and and it's something that doesn't need to be there uh so this we've had this problem in oregon for as long as i can remember I, i'm born and raised in oregon um and we've had this urban rural divide that's that's caused this and this you know frustration and tension about four years ago a group of people came along and i was not involved in the movement at that point but there was a group of people that came along and said what if instead of this constant, you know, trying to kind of take over government and force our way on, on people that have very different values and want very different things uh, and, and vice versa, what if we moved the state line of Oregon and Idaho, the border between Oregon and Idaho, and moved it to where the actual cultural divide is in the state of Oregon so that we would allow the people on the east side of the state who want the kind of government and have the kind of values as Idahoans, allow them to get state government from Idaho and let the west side of, of the state of Oregon, which is far more left-leaning and wants a totally different kinds of uh, government for their communities, they, they could keep what they want, but allow the people in Eastern Oregon to get their state level government from Idaho. And, and so this was just a grassroots idea that, that a group of people had around a, a 
uh, pizza parlor, uh, you know, and, and said, we think this is a good idea. Um, and, and it's something that's that's possible. So so just so people are aware, state lines are are just imaginary lines and, and they are something that um, they can be moved. There's a constitutional process for moving them. Um, there's a legal process for making it happen. It's happened multiple times. There's precedence for that to happen. And, and so state lines can be moved. It's an imaginary line. It's a tool that we could use to better group people that are similar to each other and want the same things. And, and so our group started about four years ago and they said, let's, let's go find out if other people think this is a good idea. We see this as a solution that makes sense. It'd be a win for Western Oregon, win for Eastern Oregon, win for the state of Idaho. Let's go directly to people and start seeing if they agree that this is something that, that they would support. And so over the course of the last four years, Brian, we've been going county by county in Eastern Oregon and asking voters, do you want your elected leaders to look into moving the state line so that Eastern Oregon counties uh, would become part of Idaho? And you know, we've gone to uh, votes in 12 counties in Eastern Oregon, and in all 12 of those counties, voters have approved our measures saying, yes, we do want our elected leaders to look into this. We think this is a good idea. We think this is a solution, a long-term solution that could be a win-win for everybody, and we want to to look into it. That was a long answer. I, I hope that wasn't too overwhelming. No, that's a that that that's the basic overview. And I remember I first heard of the movement a couple of years ago, and you know, there's been movements to move state borders or to create new states like Jefferson and California. So you know, I. I when I first heard of it, I don't think I thought too much of it. But then um, about a year ago, I was on my way to Coeur d'Alene and took the scenic route through eastern Oregon. And I actually saw signs uh, in towns and in people's farms saying, you know, greater Idaho or move the border or what, you know, they, they, they were promoting this idea. And I thought, OK, maybe this has legs. Maybe this is a, a little bit different than those uh, those past movements. So what, yeah, what's, well, yeah. so 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 one of the things that makes our movement different, because you're right, this this is something. And again, um, you know, states have state lines have changed over the course of the United States. There was this idea that there would they would need to be flexible. People change, people groups change, migrations happen. There, there's a reason to want to be able to group people differently and and have imaginary lines that do that. And and we do that all the time. We do that with congressional districts every ten years. We regroup, we redraw lines, we reapportion to give people better government that better matches what they want, better representation. Um, so there has been movements like this before. There's been whole states that have been created out of other states. There's been state lines that have been adjusted. We, you, you mentioned the state of Jefferson. The state of Jefferson is something that was very active and very popular and, and had a lot of support. Then it wanted to create a, a new state out of kind of Northern California. Um, our proposal is, is different than that in that when you go when you talk about creating a new state, and, and so just so everybody knows there's the process for these things, is, is there is a, a legal process for, for creating a new state or for adjusting a border. And it's essentially that state legislatures have to agree to do it. So, so we've gone directly to people and asked them, do you want your elected leaders to pursue this? Um, but, but the people, we, we, we don't, can't just say, you know, we declare ourselves this new state. It's, it's something, it's a process, it's a political process that goes through state legislatures. So with the Oregon-Idaho border, you're talking about the Idaho legislature and the Oregon legislature would need to come together and agree to move the border. Uh, so, so the two state legislatures would come together, they'd say, where the line is doesn't make sense right now. It, it could make more sense to move it to the Cascade Mountain Range and allow people in Eastern Oregon to become part of Idaho and those counties and allow Western Oregon to, to become a smaller footprint, but but have government that better matches the people that they represent. Um, and that's done through the two state legislatures. So with moving a border, unlike with, with trying to create a new state, which has a similar process, when you create a new state, you're talking about adding two senators, two new senators, um, to, to the U.S. Senate. And, and you get into, it, it's a much higher hurdle because you get into these kind of national politics and, and balance of power issues that, that gives people a lot of reason to say no. Um, in, in our case, we're only talking about moving a state line to include 400,000 people that currently get their state government, about 400,000 people that currently get their state government from the state of Oregon, moving them into state governance of Idaho. There would be no effect on, on any senators. There's only one representative that represents all of Eastern Oregon. He's a Republican. 
has been a Republican in my entire life because people in Eastern Oregon are very conservative, like the people of Idaho, and they vote very reliably um, conservatively. So it wouldn't upset the balance of power as far as, as the House representatives or the Senate. It wouldn't essentially change much of anything except perhaps one electoral college vote uh, as far as a national scene goes. So it, it's a proposal that we've worked very hard to make a win-win win for everybody involved in in and remove the roadblocks for, for people to say no, because, um, you know, we know that if we said, well, we just want to make a new state in Eastern Oregon, and it would mean two new Republican senators in, in the U.S. Senate, that I, the Oregon legislature would never go for it, and the U.S. Congress would, would likely also not go for it. So our proposal does away with that, and it allows people to get better representation without causing this kind of, you know, giant ripple effect at the national level. And one, one of the questions, when, when I cast out to my readers to ask for questions, I actually got a response from a Democrat from Oregon who was worried about that one electoral vote uh, being flipped from a you know generally blue state to a generally red state. Yeah, and, and it's not entirely clear. You know, we just did re reapportionment and redistricting of the House of Representatives, and Oregon actually got one extra congressional district at the national level. So we haven't even had an election um, that that where Oregon has been able to have their eight, what now be eight electoral college votes. Um, it's always been seven. We were we were added a congressional district. We're talking about 400,000 people that would move into the state of Idaho uh, governance. Um, so likely that would move that that electoral you know college vote or that congressional district that was just apportioned to Oregon, move that to the state of Idaho. But, you know, that would have to be done at the next reapportionment when, when they do all that redistricting um, down the line. But again, we're talking about even if it does, we're talking about one electoral college vote out of 538. It's a very, very minor um, impact on the national level. What it really has impact on is for the people involved at the local level, Eastern Oregonians, Idahoans and, and the Western Oregonians involved as well. So one thing I've noticed uh, looking at Idaho now uh, since I moved here five years ago is that, you know, we're a red state, but there are different regional differences in Idaho as well. Uh, North Idaho is very, very conservative. Even some would call them libertarian. Eastern Idaho, on the other hand, they're still conservative. They're socially conservative. They believe in the Second Amendment. They oppose abortion, but they are, I would say, more reliant on government. And so they're more willing to support government subsidies and regulations. There's a lot of agriculture over there. They have water rights issues, uh, the Idaho National Laboratory. So where would you see Eastern Oregon falling into that politically? Would they be, you know, socially conservative, uh, fiscally conservative? Would they be more libertarian or, you know, how, how would they fit into the Idaho paradigm? Well, you know, it's, so, so that's a that's a pretty broad brush to have to, to paint with. But I, but what we know in, in the way that or Eastern Oregonians vote is that they vote pretty conservatively, uh, socially, pretty conservatively, fiscally, conservatively. You know, we get these ballot measures in the state of Oregon that, that kind of get pushed onto the east side. But when they come up for a vote in eastern Oregon, they they usually, you know, get trounced in eastern Oregon. And like, for instance, we had Measure 110, which a lot of people have heard about, um, which legalized uh, possession of hard drugs in, in the state of Oregon. So, so Oregon has this ballot measure. It passed. It was close, but it passed because people in Northwest Oregon wanted it, wanted this policy. Um, all these Eastern Oregon counties voted overwhelmingly against this. They didn't want, the, they think this is a bad idea. This is, uh, so they voted against it. When, when legalized marijuana came up uh, several years ago, uh, every Eastern Oregon County voted against it. So, so, you know, I would say Eastern Oregon is, is very traditional very conservative, very, you know, traditional Christian values. Um, and, and they vote that way. And, and as far as like, kind of, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know that I could, you know, it's a diverse group within the kind of conservative leaning, uh, you know, section, but, but what I do know is that they vote overwhelmingly conservative and have for a very long time. And, and that is, you know, is going to continue. That was uh, one of going to be one of my other questions about the whole drug legalization issue, since it's been legal now for a couple of years in all of Oregon. You know, if the border would be moved and it then becomes illegal again, uh, do you see that causing any problems or, you know, is there going to be any enforcement issues or it it, it seems just hard to predict how uh, how a lot of things would fall down? 
Well, and, and it is hard to predict, Brian. So, so again, for your listeners and for your viewers, the, the process for moving a state line is that the two state legislatures come together. They say, OK, you know, we want to look into moving the state line and, and you know, adding these people to our state uh, and, and these counties. And through that process, the two state legislatures would come together and they would have to uh, kind of figure out all these details. What is going to happen right now? Marijuana is legal in the state of Oregon, even though these counties in Eastern Oregon didn't want that. It was it was forced through a policy that was forced through. And, and so now you've got it. And, and so now we got a mess. And, and this is part of the problem when you have government that doesn't match people's values and, and what they actually want for their communities is that the, we in Eastern Oregon have these these, you know, policies forced on us that we don't vote for and we don't want, but they're on us. Now, now we are dealing with them and now to get rid of them is going to cause problems because now people have created businesses and, and there are going to be messy things that are going to have to be, um, you know, worked out, but, but those things can be worked out. And, and, and so that would be between the legislatures to have negotiations, to talk, what would, what would that law look like? Would, would Eastern Oregon go straight to Idaho law on things like marijuana you know, potentially they would. And, and, you know, that would probably be supported by most Eastern Oregonians. Or would there be some sort of grandfathering in, you know, those are sorts of questions that we can't necessarily answer as a movement. But but that would be what the legislators involved and, and really what the people of Idaho would want. It, it, you're talking about the people of Idaho taking in these counties and, and bringing them into the fold. Uh, they would be in control to say what they want that law to look like for those people coming in. Yeah, there's a Ontario, Oregon, just across the Snake River. It's uh, apparently has several marijuana businesses, and they put up billboards in Boise telling people to yep. go uh, go cross the river and you know get their fish. yeah. And and that's you know so so there are a lot of benefits, Brian, to to the state of Idaho and and the people of the state of Idaho to to bring in Eastern Oregon, and and I can talk about those. But one of those is just that is that it pushes law that Idahoans don't necessarily want, and it, it pushes that law instead of being 45 minutes from Boise, the, the main population center, it pushes that back another 250 miles, uh, you know, back to the Willamette Valley. People of Eastern Oregon didn't want that either. They voted against it, but but it was policy that happened and now they've got it. Now we're stuck with it. Now it's a problem that's right on your, on the state of Idaho's doorstep by, by a, a, you know, moving the border, that law that, that people don't like would be pushed further away, get further away from the state of Idaho and, and be, a problem that you wouldn't have to deal with anymore. As a somebody who's interested in history and geography all my life, the the idea to me is really fascinating, um, and, and it makes sense. I think there's a lot of inertia when it comes to the way things are, the status quo, and, and so there's a lot of just instinctive resistance to moving a state border. It seems weird, uh, but you know if you step back and think about it, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to. Um, and like you said, it has happened before. I mean, West Virginia split from Virginia. It was in the middle of a civil war. So hopefully we're not in the middle of that again. But um, it's it's not like it's completely unprecedented. And you know, I Absolutely. Think, you know, yep. It's not unprecedented at all. And, and in fact, people don't know this, but but states adjust their borders in small ways fairly frequently. Like So Oregon and Washington adjusted their border in 1958. Now, it wasn't, you know, to include county, one county from one state to the other. It was a, a, a fairly minor border adjustment, but the process is there. And like you said, there's no reason that we can't use this process. It's a political process and a tool that we could use to lower the political tension in our country and, and in our states and make people's lives better, better match people up to the kind of representation they want. And one of the things we found is that there's been a lot of polling done around this idea. And, and, and so you're, you are exactly right. All these state lines, none of us alive today had anything to do with them. They've been there as long as we've been alive. Oregon has always looked like Oregon. Idaho has always looked like Idaho um, because they've been there for 150, 175, 200 years. But what we found is that when we actually put the idea up to people and say like, well, do you think people should be able to choose what sort of government works best for their communities? People overwhelmingly say yes. You know, of all the things in, in the United States, all the all the ways that we're getting more divergent as, as cultures on the left and on the right, people still agree, for the most part, that self-determination matters and is a good thing, it, that people in local communities know best what they want for their communities and what kind of government they want, and they should get the kind of government they want. So, so when people are asked about our idea, 
they think it's a good idea. It, it's kind of like what you were saying, like you don't really think about it, but then like when somebody proposes, well, what if we move the state line to add these people that are very different from the, the state government they've got now and group them together with this other group that's much more similar to them, people are saying that makes a lot of sense. That, that it's a long-term solution. It's a tool that we could use to make people's lives better, lower political tension. So there was there was polling done by the Trafalgar Group in, in Idaho, and they asked people in Idaho citizens, this was in uh, 2021, it's two years ago, and they asked Idaho citizens, essentially, if Oregon, Eastern Oregon counties voted to join the state of Idaho, and you knew that they would vote similarly to you and they would not be an economic drain on your state, would you be supportive of them, of, of the state of Idaho accepting these counties? And it was overwhelming, two to one. It was like 61% to 30% people said, yes, if, if these people wouldn't be a drag on us economically, which we wouldn't, and they would vote the same way as they're like-minded, they share the same values, and that's what they want. People of Idaho said, yes, we think that's a good idea. People of Eastern Oregon, we've been asking, going county by county, asking, do you think this is a good idea? Do you want your elected leaders to look into it? They're voting yes. They do want their elected leaders to have, to look into this. They want this conversation to move forward. Western Oregon, there was survey, there was polling done by Survey USA in 2022, and they asked Western Oregonians, so Northwestern Oregonians, where the majority of the population is in the Willamette Valley, and and they asked them, should the state look into doing this, and and what the effect would be on the state of Oregon? 68% of people said we certainly should look into it. When they asked if Eastern Oregon counties want to leave. Should we let them leave? And in, in a, 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 not a majority, but a plurality of people in, in Western Oregon said, yes, if, if people want different government and vote to leave, we should let them go get that government that makes sense for them. It's a popular idea. And, and part of the hurdle for us has been getting people to realize it is possible. It is a tool that we can use and, and in that it is something that makes sense that, that we can do. Before coming back to Idaho, um, I want to ask, you know, kind of your sense of the Oregon legislature, because as you said, it would require consent of the Idaho legislature, the Oregon legislature, and then the U.S. Congress. Uh, in your work, in your conversations with people, uh, I assume you've been talking to lawmakers. Do you see movement in the Oregon legislature to actually make this happen, or is it a is it an uphill climb? So it's an uphill climb, but we do see progress. So when I got started in this movement. Uh, I, I joined in about three years ago and and uh, got started. And, and when I got started, we didn't have any elected leaders at, at the legislative state legislative level that were vocally supportive or, or willing to introduce you know bills for us. Um, it, we were just kind of getting started. Three years down the road, we have multiple legislators that are supportive. Um, in Idaho, last year, so so we have uh, House Representative Boyle and and. Uh, uh, oh gosh, Bar um, Barbara Ehart, Representative Ehart, they co-sponsored a memorial, which basically invited the Oregon legislature to begin talks um, with the state of Idaho. That passed the Idaho House. We had a, a lot of support in the Idaho Senate, kind of stalled out in the Senate, but we have a lot of legislative support in, in, in Idaho, and we feel confident that the state of Idaho understands, you know, how this would benefit its citizens and is, is ready to have this conversation. We have not had as much success on the Oregon side. We're getting there. We, we meet with legislators all the time. Um, we just met with the Speaker of the House in Oregon a couple weeks ago. We had a memorial that was introduced in the Oregon Senate last year, last legislative session. Um, it did not go anywhere. The, the Senate president would not move it forward. Um, you know, the Oregon legislature is is complete polar opposite of the Idaho legislature. It's overwhelmingly uh, democratic, left-leaning, um, representing mostly Western Oregon. Um, so we've had more trouble getting getting traction there, but there is support for it. And and we believe that there are a lot of benefits to Western Oregon that could, you know, sway legislators over there. One, the fact that there's popular support for it. The, the pe people think this is a good idea and people think this is an idea worth looking into. Um, and, and so it's what people want and, and it's it's got popular support. And, and two, Western Oregon is wealthier than Eastern Oregon. So like most places, our urban centers tend to be wealthier than our rural areas. And, and so in Oregon, because we have a, a statewide income tax and because we have a pretty robust social service system in Oregon, which majority of Eastern Oregonians didn't vote for, but that's the way it works in Oregon is, is you know, 
we get policy that's voted on by Western Oregon. It gets forced on the whole state. But because of those things, Eastern Oregon is an economic drain on Western Oregon. And, and it's a pretty big economic drain. It's, you know, to the tune of like six to $700 per taxpayer per year gets shipped from Western Oregon to Eastern Oregon. And, and so that is a lot of money that flows from the West side of the state to the East side of the state that if they were to allow Eastern Oregonians to go become part of Idaho, they wouldn't, they, all those hundreds of millions of dollars would stay in Western Oregon. They could use them to address problems that are specific to Western Oregon. Um, there's plenty of problems in Western Oregon that, that people want money to, to you know, invest in and, and work on. Um, so they would save a lot of money. It would lower gridlock. Uh, we have a lot of gridlock in Oregon, even though Republicans are in a uh, they weren't a super minority up until this last election. Now that they're not, it's not a super majority of Democrats, but the, the Republicans have been in the minority for a very long time. But in Oregon, one of the tools that that the minority has is they can essentially walk out and and uh, you know, not show up and and deny quorum so that nothing happens at the legislative level, at the state legislative level. And that's a tool that has been used often by the Republican lawmakers. It happened in this last session in the Senate ground the Oregon legislative session to a halt for weeks. Nothing happened. No bills were passed. Um, and, and that, again, that's gridlock that doesn't need to be there. Western Oregon is pretty like-minded. They want left-leaning government. They want certain policy for their communities. And it just happens that, that that's exact opposite of what people in Eastern Oregon want. But Eastern Oregon shouldn't be blocking Western Oregon from getting the policy that they need for their communities. And Western Oregon shouldn't be forcing policy Eastern Oregon communities don't want. We could solve that problem. Let us go. And then Western Oregon Democrats would have a supermajority in the legislature again. They could pass the policy that their constituents want. And, and everybody would get the government that they want, lower political tension again. So it, all that to say, we are making progress. We have, you know, we're, when we started, we had very, very little legislative support in Oregon. That's growing all the time. And, and we get more, you know, representatives and senators on board with what we're doing and, and moving forward. And we're hopeful to get into the next legislative session and, and get our memorial through. So in addition to Representative Boyle and Representative Ehart from Idaho, have you had talks with any other Idaho lawmakers or executives or anyone in the governor's office? We have so uh, we have not met with the governor's office. We have been to the the uh, leg you know state legislature a couple of times. Last year, I was there along with our leadership team to talk to House representatives and, and senators. And you know, we've had great conversations with multiple you know, representatives and senators in the state of Idaho. And and I think that you know, again, what we're asking right now out of this legislation is to to begin these talks. Let's have this talks. Let's explore this. Let's see if this makes sense for the state of Idaho. Let's see if it makes sense for the state of Oregon. Let's see if it makes for, sense for the people of Eastern Oregon. And and again, there's a lot of a lot of legislators in Idaho, I think see the benefit in that. There there's a there's a huge benefit to the state of Idaho as far as uh, you know, Electorally, you bring in 400,000 like-minded citizens. So the people of Eastern Oregon vote just like the people of Idaho. And, and so, you know, when you're talking about Idaho is a very red state, and, and Idaho, I think, wants to remain a red state and continue to be a red state. Um, and, and people worry because Boise is growing and people are pouring in and, and, you know, the valley is just exploding. And, and as places get bigger, more urban, they tend to get more left-leaning. And, and so there's this concern and we hear this often, um, you know, uh, that, you know, that Boise is going to grow and it's going to get blue and it's going to you know start overwhelming the, the rest of the state. Bringing in 400,000 like minded rural voters from eastern Oregon would help keep Idaho the way Idaho has been rural values, rural politics, um, conservative politics, because the people of eastern Oregon, that's the way they vote. So, you know you know, politically, it, it would allow Idaho to continue to to be the Idaho that it's been uh, for years and years. So so there's that advantage. You know, another advantage that, that legislators have seen, we talked about pushing the law back, you know, getting the marijuana and getting the legalized drugs and getting all that crime, uh, you know, pushed 250 miles west. But the other thing is that Idaho is exploding in population. I don't have to tell you guys that uh, because in in Part of the reason of that is that Idaho is a very conservative uh, kind of almost refuge for all these blue states on, on the West Coast. So you have Washington, Oregon, California that are very, very blue, but but they have a lot of conservative, you know, 
citizens and, and people are fleeing those states and they're moving out of Oregon and they're moving out of Portland and they're pouring into Idaho because it's the closest, you know, conservative place that they can be. And, and you know, I, I saw that on a personal level. Me and my wife considered moving to Idaho during the pandemic because there was such a stark contrast between what was happening in Oregon uh, with lockdowns and school closures and mask mandates and vaccine mandates as compared to what was happening to Idaho. Um, so people are pouring into Idaho. They're going to continue to pour into Idaho as, as our two cultures get further and further apart and kind of blue America gets further apart from red America. You're going to continue to see these, these people moving out of blue states into places like Idaho. And it puts stress on on places like Boise and Meridian and, and these towns, you know, that that are just seeing these huge influxes of people moving the border would would give Idaho much more space for people to grow for, you know, for people to move to they wouldn't have to somebody in Portland or in the suburbs of Portland, like I was four years ago, wouldn't have to move all the way to Boise to get red state governance, they can move to Prineville, Oregon, which is only three hours away, uh, instead of having to move all the way to Boise, it would give Boise room to grow as, as people keep moving in. It would relieve the pressure valve that is happening on, on Idaho now with all these folks moving in. Uh, so, so again, again, all that to say, there's a lot of benefits to the state of Idaho and legislatively, we, we've had legislators that's, that seem to understand those benefits and understand why this is, is at least is a conversation that's worth having. So, Brian, I did want to say something because because I talked about um, when we were talking about the Oregon legislature and, and, and eastern Oregon counties. And, and I saw this. I, I, I was you know on Twitter and I saw some of the questions people were asking you that, that are pertinent to Idahoans. And, and I would have those exact same questions. And, and one of those questions was, you know, is this going to be a drain? Are these counties going to be self-supporting? Is this going to be a drain on Idaho? Because yeah, that's, that's probably the thing I've been asked the most as you know, I've had conversations over the last year. Absolutely. Who wants to bring in a bunch of people that are going to to, you know, suck money out of the system and, and be a drag on your economy? And so uh, I want to address that because the way Oregon is set up is that, again, we have a statewide income tax. We have a robust social service system. So what ends up happening is the wealthier parts of the state heavily subsidize the rural parts of the state or less wealthy. Um, but there was an economic analysis that was done by Points Consulting out of Moscow, Idaho. So this is a group that's very familiar with Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, and they did an economic analysis on what would happen economically if we moved these Eastern Oregon counties into Idaho. And what that economic analysis found was that, for one, the economies of Eastern Oregon would surge. So, so getting into Idaho's less regulation, lower taxes, uh, more freedom, you know, getting into that environment would would cause Eastern Oregon counties to and their economies to surge over and above what would be expected if they stayed in the state of Oregon. So it would be a, a great economic boon for, for Eastern Oregon. It also found that instead of being a drain on Idaho's resources or, or you know, taxes, it would, Oregon would be a benefit to the state tax wise. And, and that could be done in a number of ways, but, but by simple, you know, some simple keeping taxes that are already in place on people in Eastern Oregon and, and grandfathering them in, it would be a, a tax boon to the state of Idaho. Because and, and the reason why this works is that because Eastern Oregon, again, just like with, you know, the way that we vote in the way that we are culturally and socially, economically, Eastern Oregon is very similar to Idaho. We, we make our living the same way, um, you know, for the most part as, as Idaho does. And so our average wages are, are about the same as Idaho. So even though we're a drain on the state of Oregon, we can move into the state of Idaho and not only not be a drain uh, on the uh, state government, but we could actually be a plus that puts money into the coffers of the state government of Idaho. As a corollary to that, um, one of the big debates we've been having in Idaho for the last four or five years is Medicaid, Medicaid expansion. Uh, it's now the single largest line item in the entire state budget at four and a half billion dollars each year. Uh, do you have any idea how it, that would be affected by moving the border Would those, you know, how many of those 400,000 citizens would be on some form of state assistance that would then be you know, required to go on our ledger? Yeah, I, I don't have that, you know, exact. I, 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 if you look at that and people can go online and they can find that report on, at our uh, site, greateridaho.org and, and, that is the most thorough economic analysis that we have. And so it goes into all these things about, you know, what sorts of um, 
assets those these 400,000 folks would come with and what, what sorts of debts they'd come with and, and what we would expect tax wise and what we'd expect benefit wise. It goes into all those details. I don't have that off the top of my head um, as far as like kind of that breakdown of how many Eastern Oregonians would would be on, you know, transfer from Medicaid. But, you know, what I can say is when, when this economic analysis was done and they looked at the, the grand scope of things, they said the Eastern Oregon counties could come into the state of Idaho and be a benefit to the state of Idaho and not a drain. And, and so, again, another reason why we see this as a win, it'd be a win for the people of Idaho, it'd be a win for the people of Eastern Oregon, and it'd be a win financially for the, the state of the remaining part of the state of Oregon. And like you said, it might uh, do something about this pressure valve that's building in our country as, you know, people with diametrically opposed worldviews are having to fight over living in the same under the same government. Absolutely. And, and I can tell you, you know, as somebody who lived, so I lived in the, I, for your, your listeners, I was born in central Oregon uh, and I, I went to college over on the west side of the state. I was in the Portland metro area for 20 years. I'm back over on the east side of the state. Um, and, and I can tell you that there are a lot of people that would love to, to be in a red state in, in Western Oregon. There, and there's a lot of people that there's a lot of conservative people and, and they would love to have the governance of Idaho. But but moving all the way from, you know, Western Oregon to Idaho is a very, very long ways. Um, it's not nearly as far. If, if that border were on the Cascade Mountain Range, I think you would see an influx of people moving from the west side of the state to the east side of the state. Um, we already see it just to get to the culture, but if they had the government to match it, I, I think you would see it again, a, a huge boon for these Eastern Oregon counties, which would only help the state of Idaho in the long run. So one of the folks who replied when I asked for questions asked about if you have a plan B, you know, let's say you put in 10 or even 15 years into this project and then, you know, one or both legislatures say, well, we're just not going to do it. Um, do, do you have a idea of where to go, where we, where would you go from there to continue to solve the problems that this is seeking to solve? Yeah, that's a great question because, because I think that that's the key is what you were just saying is we know we have this problem. We have this problem in the state of Oregon, but we have this problem nationally as well. Our urban culture and, and values are, are drifting further and further away from our rural culture and values. And, and it's getting to a point, you know, when I was a kid, I, I would get into arguments with people, well, not a kid, but when I was a younger man, I would get into arguments with people about tax rates and things like that. That seems like so long ago, Brian, mm -hmm. like like arguing over tax levels seems like, you know, child's play. Now we're arguing about, can you abort up to birth or can you, you know, gender affirming care here? I mean, it's like, it, it's so much more um extreme divergence between these two cultures of, of kind of the traditional christian rural values of eastern oregon and, and a place like idaho and the, the more um left-leaning progressive values of a place like portland you know and and it's getting to the to the point where it's not tolerable for these two groups of people to try to to kind of force their way on the other and in, in, in a way that hasn't been true in the past it, you know like if, if i didn't like a higher minimum wage, but I was forced to live under a higher minimum wage, I'd be like, well, this, you know, this is dumb, but, but it, you know, I wasn't going to pick up and move because the minimum wage went up $2. Um, but we're talking about things that, that really are now we're getting to a point where it's like people will not continue to live under un intolerable conditions. So there will be a sorting. This is what we saw during COVID, mm -hmm. you know, Oregon was a hard lockdown state. And this was true of, of most of the West Coast states. Oregon, Washington, California kind of had a, they all kind of worked in concert together. And, and people fled Oregon because their kids were out of school. They couldn't go to church. They couldn't run their businesses. They, they were having all sorts of mandates forced on them. So they were fleeing to places like Idaho for the freedom that's there. Um, I don't see that changing. Personally, I, I, I continue to see these these cultures diverging and, and you're getting more and more topics that people are going to say, you know, what? I just can't live under that. I'm not going to live under that. or I'm not going to to accept that. So we got to find some ways to solve this this political divergence and this political crisis that we have. We think our idea is a good one and we think it makes the most sense long term. We think it makes it makes a ton of sense for Eastern Oregon and Idaho and, and Western Oregon. It can make sense in other parts of the country as well, where you have this urban rural divide and, and you have like a, a you know, what, what works so well about Idaho and Oregon is that Idaho and Eastern Oregon are basically the same place. If, if you look at a map and like you look at like a satellite map and, and you were to say, 
what what are these regions where how would you group these regions together and there's no lines on it you, you would never take like right there on the snake river and be like oh well i'm going to take this eastern dry part of this part and stick it with this western wet part you know it it's it's a legacy of of history that happened a long time ago um so so in our case it just it naturally fits the geography fits the culture fits it it, it uh, you know, like I said, economically, we make our living the same way for the most part, and we are have about the same average wage. Um, so, so it makes a ton of sense in, in Oregon and Idaho. And but there's other places in the country it can make sense too. All that to say, you asked me what's Plan B. We don't have necessarily a Plan B at this point. This is Plan A, and Plan A is let's move through this process, and and we continue to make progress through this process. So. Three years ago, we'd had two counties that had voted for this. Then we got to six. Then we got to seven. Then we got to, to nine. Then we got uh, in the Idaho House last year. We made progress. We got through the, our first legislative body. We continue to build and grow and get closer to achieving our goal. So, so for now, there is no plan B. We're going to be back in the Idaho legislature. We're going to be back in the Oregon legislature and, and try to move this. Um, but if, if that doesn't work, if like you said, if, if we get to the point where at some point – the Oregon legislature, let's say, because because that's where our biggest stumbling block is right now. That's kind of where we're, we're stacked up against. If we come to the conclusion at some point that, hey, they're just not going to ever let us go, um, then then there's other things that you can do to solve this problem. Uh, you know, you could in Oregon, we have statewide ballot measures. We could go directly to the people and, and potentially say, you know, we're going to circumvent the legislature. And, and, you know, will the people support this? There's been talk floated around by legislative uh, uh, members that, that I've been privy to say, well, what if we had legislation that allowed for, um, you know, counties that are less than a certain population to be able to opt out of certain policy or statewide ballot measures? So there's other ideas out there, but we've got to get the, 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 the goal overall is to get people matched up to government that they want, that makes sense for them that will lower political tension and, and allow people to build the communities that they want to build and, and live in peace and, and, you know, and, and raise their families the way they want to. That's the end goal. There's, there's going to be several ways to possibly to get there. We think this is the best way to get there. And we think it's the best solution for the people of Oregon and Idaho. You mentioned other states. Have you had conversations with people in Washington, you know, Eastern Washington, or perhaps Northern California who might, want to make a greater, greater Idaho, or are they sitting back and waiting to see how your movement does? Yeah. So, so originally our movement tried to include Eastern Washington and Northern California. So you, you mentioned earlier in, in the, the podcast, the state of Jefferson and state of Jefferson is still alive to, to some degree. Um, although the Oregon, uh, you know, lead in, uh, of the state of Jefferson is now supporting our movement, thinks it's more doable. We've made more progress. We have more momentum. Um, so we initially looked at the way people vote and we said, you know, it would make sense for Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon and Northern California. All these people are conservative. All these people vote the same way. Um, it would make sense for all of them to, to be part of kind of a greater, greater Idaho. Um, when we start going directly to people, though, Brian, what, what we found was that just because people vote the same way doesn't necessarily mean that culturally they fit the same way. When we ask voters in Eastern Oregon, would you want to get your state level government from Idaho? People in Eastern Oregon are saying yes. And, and they're saying yes, pretty overwhelmingly. It's like, yeah, I think our average winning percentage is 60 to 40. Like, like people, people in Eastern Oregon identify with the state of Idaho. A lot of people in Eastern Oregon do more of their business in Idaho than they do in Portland, you know? Um, so, so people in Eastern Oregon are very comfortable with Idaho. They identify similarly to Idaho. They have the same values. We went to votes in Southern Oregon, which also votes very conservatively, but we went to votes in three different three different times, two counties in Southern Oregon, and we lost in all three of those votes. Um, and, and what that told us was that, again, just because people vote similarly doesn't mean necessarily culturally that, that it would be a great fit. And, and the people in Southern Oregon don't, for whatever reason, identify the same way as Eastern Oregonians do with people of Idaho. Um, and so when, when we lost those ones in Southern Oregon, it made us realize, let's take a step back and, and let's move the group of people who are most culturally similar to Idahoans and, and let's work on getting that done first. And then once we've accomplished that, then we can expand this in, into where does it make sense for other groups? But right now where it makes the most sense 
is to take Eastern Oregon and, and move that border and get Eastern Oregon into the state of Idaho. You know, my gut feeling, just based on, you know, following current events and knowing history, is that it's a it is a tall order. But if this were successful, it would open the floodgates and you'd start seeing the same movements in New York and Illinois in a lot of these other states where there's large regions that are, you know, very different from the majority in the state. I, I think we'd see a lot of rearranging of borders. I, I think you're right. And, and we hear that, you know, I, I've done radio shows in New York, in Denver, because this is not a again, this is not something that's unique to the state of Oregon. Oh, it's it's happening all over the place. You have your urban centers, which have a, its own kind of politics, its own kind of culture, its own kind of value set. And then you have rural areas and you get these states like Colorado, where Denver is very, very urban and very, very left leaning and progressive. But then, you know, the rest of the state is rural and, and, you know, doesn't want to have the same kind of policy that that the city of Denver does. So you get this you know, divide this, this urban rural divide. And and that happens. You mentioned Illinois, New York, same thing. So these, are, this is a problem all over our country. It's a problem that's causing tension. It's causing friction. Um, we need to find some solutions and we're on the front line of that and, and moving forward with a solution that people support. Again, you know, when we ask people in Idaho, people in Idaho think it's a good idea. When, when we ask people in Eastern Oregon, they think it's a good idea. When we ask people in Western Oregon, they, they say, yes, this, this is something that should or could happen. Um, so this is an idea that could could move across the country. You know, in in this case, it works so well in Oregon and Idaho because of all those factors we've talked about. Economically, we wouldn't be a drain, but it's not always going to be the case. Some some parts, you know, of one state trying to join another might not match up economically, might not match up culturally. In the case of, of greater Idaho, we do meet all those criteria. There's very little impact on the national scene. So there's not a lot of reason for, uh, you know, Washington, D.C. If Oregon and Idaho decided we want to come together, we want to move the border, we want to move these 400,000 people into Idaho, there's not a lot of reason for people in Washington, D.C. to be upset about it. Um, so, you know, again, you could see a takeoff. It, it could be that, that Oregon and Idaho are uniquely in a position to have something like this make sense. Um, you know, we'll just have to see what happens going down the road. So for your movement, as it's grown over the last four years, uh, have you lined up, you know, people who are uh, supporting it, fundraising for it, uh, donating to it, you know, whether publicly or privately, who are, uh, you know, interested in seeing it go forward? Absolutely. So so we're a grassroots organization. And, and so we are just funded by individual donors. And, and that's we've had donors, hundreds of donors from all over the world. Brian, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like sometimes, you know, say like, oh, man, this person from Sweden you know, supports our movement and is sending us a check, you know, or, or wherever, you know, like um, we get people from all over the country, all over the world that are interested in our movement and think it's a good idea and support the idea of self-determination, support the idea of finding peaceful political solutions to difficult problems. Um, and, and so, yes, that being said, we can always use more donations. You know, it, it costs money to do politics. And, mm -hmm. and I know people don't like that. And I don't I don't like it. But it is what it is. What it is. It, it costs money to get your message out. It costs money to move through the legislature. Um, it, the legislature is not so easy as just saying, "Hey, I have this good idea. Let's let's get this you know, a bill passed." There's you know there's a reason why there's lobbyists and and they cost a lot of money. Um, so it, everything takes money. We can always use more donations. And anybody that's that's interested or thinks this is a good idea or worthy of supporting. Can go to greateridaho.org and donate to help us out. But um, again, this is we don't have what we don't have is we're not a giant corporate. We don't have any giant corporate sponsorships or anything. We don't have you know um, big businesses throwing millions of dollars our way. We have individual donors who think this is a good idea. We have grassroots uh, people working on the movement, like myself, and and um, you know who are just doing this because we think it's a good idea. We think it's a solution that makes sense. And, and we think it's something that could um, make our country and our state better moving forward. I'll put the links to your website uh, here in the notes. And, you know, I'll, I'll be, you know, reading more about this, writing about this in the future. I think it's a conversation we, you know, all of us need to have because, you know, our country's reaching, uh, you know, some sort of breaking point and either it's going to happen peacefully with uh, thoughtfulness or it's going to just blow up like a powder keg. And I'd rather it be the, the former personally. I think we all would. And, and, and again, you know, I think that is a, a key to this, Brian, is that this is a 
way to solve a problem. It's a problem everybody knows exists. And, you know, you, you ask anybody, is there too much, you know, political division and, and strife? And people, almost everybody would say yes. Well, this is a way to solve that problem. And, and it's, a, it's a way to solve that problem in a way that creates wins for everybody that, that doesn't cause more tension, actually lowers political tension. And, and it's a good idea. And, and people do support it. Um, and, and I agree we need solutions and we need some things that, that, uh, you know, are going to make things better and, and not just kind of wait for, you know, whatever to, to, you know, boil over and, and deal with the fallout. Last question from a friend of mine. Do you think it would sweeten the deal for the Oregon legislature if we threw in Boise as a trade? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I get that question a lot actually. And, and I get what I get is I get, well, what about Boise? Because Boise is fairly left leaning, right? And so, what about poor Boise? That how how do they, you know, if you get to have the government you want, how come Boise can't? And and you know, a couple answers to that is we believe this this movement. You know, people try to call it secession or whatever. We're not a secession movement. We're a self determination. We believe very much that the the peaceful path forward, and as it always has been in our country is to use the political process to get people government that they want and make sense. Government by the, the people, for the people, with the consent of the people. And that's what will be the best case scenario in every way. So, you know, if, if that means that, that you know, for people in Boise, that they need to have more autonomy, you know, like, again, we're supportive of, of self-determination. People should have the kind of government that they want that makes sense. Um, you know, and, and as far as, as, you know, like we were talking earlier about other other solutions, you know, it, if there's others, if there's a big city, if the city of Portland came to Oregon voters and said, you know, we want to be part of Washington, I think most Oregon voters would be supportive of that. Like, like, you know, this isn't just about red people getting to live in red states. It's about getting people matched up to government that they want. And we're open to solutions that that match people up. Yeah. It'll be interesting to follow this uh, over the next few years to see. Um, you said uh, which county was coming up next for the referendum? So Crook County, that's where I live, is, is in Crook County, and, and we'll be the 13th county to vote on it. So far, 12 out of 12 Eastern Oregon counties have voted yes. Uh, so Crook County will be voting in May, and, and we're expecting a good result because, um, you know, we people in Crook County are, are uh, very similar in, in to the rest of the people in Eastern Oregon, and people in Eastern Oregon think this is a good idea. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time and for coming on and sharing uh, your ideas and your vision with the people of Idaho. And you know, it's uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, well, thanks for having me on, Brian. Absolutely. I appreciate it. I want to thank Matt again for taking the time to talk to us today. I invite you to check out the Greater Idaho Movement on the web or social media. I'll add those links to the notes. People are starting to talk about this more and more. So now's the time to learn about this idea to debate the pros and cons, so we're ready for whatever comes next. Thank you for watching this episode of The Gem Stream, and remember to, sub and remember to subscribe at gemstate.substack.com. I'll see you later.